welcome. I am Master Owen Lemary. Uh, thank you all for being here this early in the morning. Uh, so, the piece I'm going to present to you is from The Night of the Burning Pestle. It is a play uh, from the Elizabethan stage. It was published in 1613. Now, the introductory note says the person who published it had hold of it for two years, which dates it back to at least 1611. I have also found one reference of it being performed in 1607. So that gives you at least a general time frame, but we know for certain that it was released with a publication date of 1613. Uh, for anyone who wants to look, this is actually a reproduction of the original publication. So you know what it looked like in handwriting. Um, the introductory letter, which is called the Epistle Dedicatory, is here, written by William Burr, who was the publisher of this piece. The piece was not originally credited in this production. However, there was a later printing that credits the authors as John Fletcher and Francis Beaumont. So they are considered to be the authors of the work. Uh, in the introductory message, he also notes that the play was written in eight days. So the fact that it had two authors makes that a lot more plausible. So basically, the attribution is Beaumont and Fletcher, at least 1613. That is what we know. The play is a very interesting piece. It's a comedy. And it starts out as a typical Elizabethan play with a grand prologue and iambic pentameter. And then somebody stands up from the audience and interrupts the prologue, saying, you know, why do we not have more plays about common people? How come there are no grocers in this story? And they actually insist that a member of the audience, of course, is an actor in disguise, be brought into the play. So a second plot line is added to the play in which this young man is pretending to be, who's an actor, pretending to be an actor, pretending to be thrust into a play as a grocer who then goes on to pretend to be a knight. <laughs> um, the closest, I'm trying to figure out how to act this, what kind of acting style to use, and the closest equivalent I can think of are the players in Midsummer Night's Dream, where they're actors playing mechanicals who don't know how to be actors performing for the Duke. And so I'm going for um, a naturalistic acting style in the sense that it isn't in rhythm and meter and stylized gesture. On the other hand, I think it should also be horribly overacted because the person you know, <laughs> is an actor being someone who is not, who's supposed to be a grocer from the audience. So that is my plan. We'll see if it works. Um, so I guess I will discuss and answer questions more after the performance. Um, I do want to warn you that there will be an entrance through here. I think it's probably doable, but just so people are aware. Um, and yes, cheers. Ooh, that's a good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, these knights are much to be commended, who, neglecting their possessions, wander through deserts with their squire and dwarf, to relieve poor ladies. Hope there are no such courteous and fair well-spoken knights in this age. They will call one the son of a whore that Palmerin of England would have called fair sir, and one that Rosaclear would have called right beauteous damsel. They will call damned bitch. <laughs> <laughs> but what brave spirit would be content to sit with a flapping of wood and a blue apron before him, selling Mithridatum and dragon's water to visited houses, when he might pursue feats of arms, and, and through his noble achievements procure such a famous history to be written of his heroic prowess. Why should I not then pursue this course, for the credit of myself and our company? I shall be the said knight. For in all the worthy books of achievement, I do not call to mind that yet I read of a grocer errant. <laughs> <laughs> but have you heard of any that have wandered, unfurnished of his squire and dwarf? My elder apprentice Tim shall be my squire, and little George my dwarf, yes. Hence my blue apron. Yet, in remembrance of my former trade, I shall have portrayed upon my shield a burning pestle. 
and I shall be the knight of the burning pestle. <laughs> Tim! My trusty squire. And, and George, my dwarf. <laughs> I charge you, henceforth, to call me by no other name but the right, courteous, and valiant Knight of the Burning Pestle. Also, you shall call no female woman nor wench, but only fair lady, if she have her desires, or distressed damsel, if otherwise. And all forests and heaths shall be deserts, and all horses palfreys. Tim, stand out. Admit that this were a desert, and over it a knight errant cricket, <laughs> and I should bid you inquire his intents. What would you say? Sir, my master sends me to know whither you are riding. No! <laughs> Thus! Fair sir, the right courteous and valiant knight of the burning pestle commands me to inquire on what adventure you are bound, whether to relieve a distressed damsel or otherwise. Uh, courteous and valiant knight of the burning pestle, <laughs> here is a distressed damsel to have half a penny of pepper. <laughs> we leave her with all courteous language. Then shut up my shop, no more my apprentice, and my dwarf, or no more my apprentices, but my trusty beloved squire, and my dwarf, I must bespeak my shield and my arming pestle. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, Huzzah! And Colette, the current bardic champion of Madrona, as Tim the Princess. Huzzah! Huzzah! Huzzah. 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 So, yes, one of the reasons I wanted to do this play was that it was fun. Right. Please come in. Oh, look, it's more. <laughs> Actually, the theater that um, produced this play did have child and student actors. And one of the <laughs> questions was, you know, Sorry. were characters like George the Dwarf really? And that also, when the play was first produced, uh, there is reason to believe that it was not actually all that well received. And we don't know whether that's because of the, you know, satirical material, or if, you know, if it was performed by a student company and not that well performed. Um, it was, however, later revived, and after that became popular. Um, any questions about this performance or the performance style to start with? Were people entertained? Yes! <laughs> yes. yes. Um, okay, so any general questions? Are there any other examples of plays with the similar sort of format of the hecklers and the plants and the audience I being involved in the script? I have not seen this particular one. There are other plays within plays. The gentleman in the back was just speaking of a 1601 play that breaks the fourth wall. So clearly, you know, that experimental edge was starting to come into the theater. One of the things that I actually really adore about Elizabethan theater is it's this happy little borderland between the old theater, which was allegorical and had, you know, choruses and narrations and, you know, that sort of thing. It was very stylized. Or like, you know, the Italian theater at the time was all... This is the proper movement for this character. You know, so it was moving to a more natural uh, sort of pre presentation. And at the same time, it had language with meter and rhythm. It had asides to the audience and monologues in which the character simply unfolds what's in their mind. And it's this glorious melding of what we consider modern theater with characters and psychology and stylized theater. Of course, the downside of that is it always makes it hard to determine what exact performance style you should be using for a piece, which is why I started this one by saying, this is how I'm going to perform it. Um, does that sort of dance around your question? Yes. <laughs> uh, any other? Um, in your documentation, you mentioned that this play probably was performed at Blackfriars. What can you tell us about uh, both the actors performing at Blackfriars, what the experience was like for them, and also what was the experience like for the audience? Well, uh, starting with the second half of the question, um, Blackfires, when you think of the Elizabethan theaters, people tend to picture the globe. Blackfires was a smaller, uh, more indoor, more intimate setting. The uh, rows of benches came fairly close to the stage, and you, people could actually buy stools and sit on the edges of the stage. 
Um, so this was an excellent venue to have plants in the <laughs> audience. You know, the people that would get up and say, oh, I'm a grocer, and I'm upset that there are no grocers in this play. They had no trouble reaching the stage. Um, one of the things that was, is interesting, though, is that one of the people that interrupts the play is a grocer's wife. And it's been pointed out that that person would be played by a male. Because there were no female actors, um, it, was, it was immoral to have women on the stage. <laughs> um, so one of the questions that I've seen in, in the research was, could they have pulled that off? You know, and the, 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 it's a really interesting question. My theory is the person sitting next to the actor probably knew what they were sitting next to. But because they could have people either you know, on a stool in the corner of the stage or at the edge of the front row, and bear in mind, there's no artificial lighting, right? There's no spotlights or anything. So someone sitting with their cloak up like this, not drawing attention to themselves, at least had a possibility of being, you know, just seen as, oh, that dumpy woman sitting in the corner there, and not, oh, look, it's an actor. What's he doing here? We don't really know. Um, actors at the time um, generally learned you know, lots of plays. They performed in the repertory. They had very little time to rehearse. Had a prompter. A lot of this stuff came up in the uh, Macbeth last night, for those of you who saw it. Um, and as I mentioned, there was also you know, student and children actors at the Blackfriars Theater. So that is another very real possibility for this play. Um, is that the area you're hitting me in? OK. Uh, any other questions? Judges first, then audience. Would this play uh, have been performed differently uh, by children as with adults, or would it have been performed exactly the same? Um, I don't really have any documented answer to that question. Um, supposition, um, because people are speculating that that's one of the reasons it may not have done, been done well, based on that speculation, I would assume they would be given pretty much the same script. But I honestly have no documented answer to that. What would the, do we know about Blackfriars, what the audience composition would be? Was it more of a common people's house, or was it, um, would it have had more strata? It was slightly more expensive, so while it would not be inaccessible to the common people, you would probably get a lower percentage of them. I mean, that's the best I can tell you. Mm -hmm. so but I mean, just in fact that it physically, you know, cost a little bit more to get in. How much? And that I also don't have that one, <laughs> but I mean, it's, we're talking pennies, but you know, they add up. <laughs> you know, um, yes, yeah, so there are a lot of things I'm gonna have to say I don't know, but I'm gonna be honest about that. Is this the only play that we have extant of this by these particular authors? Their other plays do they mirror the same kind of style? Um, there are other plays by the authors, and one of the things that I, I don't know exactly, but one of the things that I have seen discussed in the, this, <coughs> the stuff I researched about this play is people trying to figure out, oh, that bit must be Beaumont, you know, or that bit must be Fletcher, from which I. Conceived, conceived that they had fairly different styles. Mm -hmm. And the play actually has two running plot lines that are kind of intentionally uncomfortably forced together. Mm -hmm. So it is very conceivable that you know, the original play, which was called, um, I'm blanking just a second, um, um, The London Merchant. The original play, you know, may have, most of its plot line may have been taken by one author and the Night of the Burning Pestle stuff, which gets much more quickly overblown and much more comedic. It may have been written by the other author. Um, but that's really, I don't, I can't say, oh, Fletcher wrote that. I'm sorry. Would the audience have been able to rapidly figure out that they were watching a staged, uh, you know, a, a setup, or would they, some of them have been slow to realize that, wait, what's going on here? That is a very fascinating question. Um, because certainly today, you know, we're used we to this it. kind of trick, <laughs> right. right? I mean, you know, you have Ferris Bueller talking right at the camera. You have uh, Tom Stoppard plays where the film critics get killed on stage. Um, <laughs> you know, that is an interesting question. I assume, um, I would have to think that the grocer's wife would pretty be become, fairly quickly become obvious as a male and therefore an actor. Um, but it is an interesting notion is, you know, how off guard would this have caught an audience that was not used to the sort of convention? Mm -hmm. And thank you, I love the question. <laughs> I wish I had a better answer. Um, 
What is the significance of the blue apron? Is that um, I you know, was not able to find that. I did some research on that. Um, clearly, from just contextual evidence, it's part of his job, which is why I started to throw it away and then decided to treat it with a little bit more reverence. Um, he references it twice in the speech, which gives it importance. Um, and clearly, you know, the other odd thing is he calls himself a grocer, but then talks about distributing medicines, which means that he's probably not a green grocer. He's probably more what we consider today in England to be a chemist or a pharmacist here. I looked up Mithridatum and Dragon's Water, and that was kind of odd because if you look up Mithridatum by itself, it's you get a bunch of references to a cure all, a you know, a poison antidote, a universal poison antidote. In conjunction with Mithridatum, however, they were sold together specifically as medicines for the plague. Um, so he's actually our grocer is actually I think a bit of a chemist or an apothecary. Yeah. Yeah, from the judge. Oh, so from the judge's first, yes. That's interesting in the it seems that uh, sometimes the, um, in, in some of the things like pewter badges, chemists seem often to be an object of ridicule. Do you mm -hmm. think that might be a, a well, it would certainly feed choice you, in, it would certainly in, feed in why the play because put him up there? You know, and also it's also interesting to me that the there's a grocer in the audience who puts his young attendant into the play right. to play a grocer. So I'm actually kind of making fun of my own master. I'm above my station oh, when I'm playing this part. Um, so yeah, that's also, I think, a good reason to bring ridicule into it. Mm. So that dovetails nicely out of my question, which is, um, you know, the original play, The London Merchant, is criticized for not being about the people. So another play is interjected into it. And in that interjected play, your character, in the scene that we saw, criticizes the knighthood of the day. So on a couple levels, it's criticizing or ridiculing the upper classes. How would that have been received in Blackfires in circa 16? That would have been edgy. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were talking earlier before the story about bribing the master of rebels. But I mean, literally, there was a position that, you know, theater, Elizabethan theater had almost a morality police. You know, we, that's why you did not put a, man, uh, a woman on stage. You know, because the, the powers that be, particularly Her Majesty, thought that was a bad thing and could lead to naughtiness. So, yeah, con, you know, condemning the, the nobility of your day, that's a little rough. He does have the advantage of being such a clown character. And he's not even supposed to be you know, an educated character. He's this grocer's apprentice from the audience, right? So he might, you know, it's like a fool can say things that nobody else can say. Mm -hmm. he, he might have gotten away on that level, but you're right, that was actually probably a pretty daring thing to do, and might also have to do with why the play was not initially well received. As a knight, do I need to get a dwarf? <laughs> <laughs> I, I can recommend you mine. Makes the blinds faster than this so this is all going faster than I expected, but that happens. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm happy to keep talking. Um, more water. Uh, so are there any further questions or ideas? or? So um, you mentioned earlier the stock nature of Commedia dell'arte and the idea that, that specific characters had specific positions and you also mentioned that this was a transition between that classical form and that kind of more naturalistic form. Did uh, Elizabethan fever or Elizabethan fever, Elizabethan <laughs> theater, uh, <laughs> much, the same thing. much the same thing, um, <laughs> did it eschew entirely those Commedia dell'arte ideas? I know England is a, is a backwater in Renaissance society. <laughs> I know, I'm, I'm from there. Uh, but is it, was that completely eschewed? Did that play any reference in it? Did actors train with um, that, or was it more a, like a British school? Of I get the impression, there, there's probably two different answers to that question. Yeah. I get the impression that more naturalistic acting was valued. I mean, for example, even though the speeches are often iambic pentameter, they sound really awkward if you stress the dynamic camera when you say them. Um, and there's, you know, a great speech in Hamlet enjoining the actors to, you know, please behave naturally and don't be overblown. Um, on the other hand, the, the other answer, however, is the comedic characters definitely inform the writing. Uh -huh. 
Um, you can take apart Taming the Shrew and find comedic characters all through it. You know, um, from the, the old miser who's, you know, and, and the, the difficult woman that the, the fool character must, must deal with. And, you know, that, so a lot of the writing conventions, a lot of the stories they were telling were still informed by that tradition. Is that a fair answer to your yes, question? Yes, no, yeah. Right. Have you thought about, I just in some of the conversation we've had about the sort of similarities with jester satire of the upper classes in an upper class audience, have you thought about doing it with a more stylized jester sort of tone? Cool, um, cool I, tone? I'm trying to, I'm, I chose my preferred style both because I thought I could justify it, you know, with what possibly happened, and also because it would be very accessible to an audience. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in researching this, I found reference to an interesting production that someone did in modern times of the script. And what they did was they did um, all the original actors have bright white clown faces and gestures, sort of colorful costumes, and they prance on stage. And then the characters that are brought to the stage are trying to keep up with them in their n normal clothing and acting in a more natural style to create that contrast. Mm -hmm. And I actually thought that was actually a brilliant staging notion. It would play. I mean, there's nothing in the script that would make that not work. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think that would have been done on the Elizabethan stage. Mm -hmm. Typically, Elizabethan actors wore Elizabethan clothing. You know, this is my poor attempt. Um, even if the play was set in, say, ancient Greece, right. at best they might throw on, you know, a an additional piece of fabric to show that they're a Roman tradition over their Elizabethan clothing. <laughs> I'm Spartacus. Yeah. <laughs> um, so unless someone was, you know, had a specific costume piece like Lear's Fool references his coxcomb and actually hands it to somebody. So we pretty much know that he wore a coxcomb. But other than that, it's probably the safest assumption is that they were wearing pretty basic Elizabethan clothes mm -hmm. and not a lot of, you know, stylized makeup and stuff. So the selection you chose um, chose off the character very nicely. Did you consider uh, adding in an additional scene also showing off that character, or, or were you determined to keep it in one scene? Can, can you talk a little bit more about what else you thought of doing? OK, well, basically, my this scene actually is highly edited. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then if you've got a bit of the, the documentation on the back, in the final back, back pages, you see the scene without editing. Mm -hmm. The major difference is, is I keep getting interrupted by the grocer and his wife on stage saying basically, yeah, go get him, Rafe. You know, um, so I cut that out to create a monologue. Um, this, the other scene I was really tempted to do, which would have been a little harder to stage the, the small space and get the correct effect, was the opening scene. Because the prologue comes on and he says, from all that's great, from all within the compass of the city walls, and this grocer gets up and starts talking to him. And I mean, with it, if I could have done that without warning, the audience would have been, what? Hey, wait, is that what you know? And that, so I was very tempted to do that scene, but it would have been much harder to do with this venue. You know, it would have involved more people. It would have, uh, I would not have been able to edit characters out of it. And the other thing I've found in these competitions is it's great to work with somebody else, but the judges want to see me if I'm the competitor. Mm -hmm. You know, so I tried to do something that... The other thing I, I will confess, the other thing that really sold me on the scene is Julian's line. <laughs> because it is such a beautiful counterpoint. All this nobility and nights and dreams and hey, we have a distressed damsel wants to buy a half penny of pepper. You know, I mean that's just he, that he undercuts that so brilliantly. So that that line also really sold me on this particular scene. And yes, there are bits of documentation floating about the room. Please feel free to look at them. Um, Yeah. Well, actually, real quick on that note, do I have to 10.30 to 11? 10.30 to 11. Okay. So, yes, we have time, but I just want to know how much. <laughs> um, since I know Commedia is a member of your interests, um, would you say that this character in any way ties into the Commedia stock character? Um, there's, at least conceptually, I mean, there's an archetype in Commedia that the servants, the lower classes, the fools, are the fun ones to watch. And you know, a lot of it, in fact, there's a term for it. The zanis in Comedia are the, the clever servants, in which, from which we get the phrase zany. Mm -hmm. 
And so you know, this is that, that archetype. He's, he's a little higher because instead of being bossed around by somebody, he runs his own grocer. But once again, he's the common man in the play full of you know, nobles. And that makes him a kind of a fun comedy character. And I think that's definitely a convention that is very strong in comedy as well. Oh, you know, unless there are any other questions, thank you. You've been a wonderful audience. I appreciate the question. Uh, I appreciate the chance to perform for all of you. And once again, I want to thank Julian and the rest.